Okay, welcome everybody to the virtual field trip for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. I'm really excited to be here with you all. If you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. We will also have a few polls, so feel free to just keep in touch with us as we move along and hopefully make this an interactive experience. So I am just going to share my screen. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see this. Can everyone see my screen okay? I don't see a nodding head, so I'm going to assume that is yes. <laughs> So again, hello everybody. My name is Kimberly Arcand and I'm a visualization scientist for NASA's Chandra XR Observatory at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. I have some very special colleagues here with me today, Kristen Devona, Rutu Ja and Nance Wolk. And then we will also be seeing a few videos from some of our colleagues, Belinda Wolks, Eileen Collins, Sabina Hurley and Daniel Castro. So lots of people to hear from today. I really hope you enjoy this journey through NASA's Chandra X Observatory. And what I thought we would do is start off our virtual field trip with a quick poll. So if we could launch poll number one, the question is, would you ever want to go into space? If you were ever given the opportunity, would you like to go into the space, maybe take a trip to the space station or perhaps go to the moon? The reason I asked this question is that for me, the answer is a definite no. And I see it looks like most people would indeed like to go to space. So you're all very courageous. That's cool. All right. So let me close the poll. Thank you so much for answering it. Oh, that poll won't go away. There we are. So I am not an astronaut. I did actually want to be an astronaut when I was very young. I love the idea of zipping off somewhere really amazing in space. But then I found out pretty quickly that for me, at least, I could barely go on like the tilt to whirl at my local amusement park. So the idea of going up to space got a little less attractive at that point. And I've had my feet sort of firmly planted on the ground ever since with no regrets. I would say that my own path into working for a NASA mission is perhaps a little different than what you might expect. It's not through astrophysics, for example. I started out in molecular biology, so I was looking at things underneath a microscope. And then I wandered to my computer science department and it felt like I found my home. I really enjoyed using computers to be able to tell the stories of science, to be able to work with the data from science. And that combination of science and computer science brought me to working for NASA's Chandra XR Observatory. So for me, coding was a sort of key that helps unlock the universe. So at any point, if during the presentation you have a question, please put it in chat. Nance and Rutu and Kristen are all happy to answer questions. So please go ahead and do that whenever you have time. So going back to Chandra, Chandra X-ray Observatory was launched back in 1999 aboard NASA's Space Shuttle Columbia. And it was a beautiful nighttime launch. I have a brief message to you from Colonel Eileen Collins, who was the commander of the STS-93 mission that launched Chandra up into space. So here is a special message for you. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch 
and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous. We were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later, and that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like to be in a space shuttle launch? It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. Our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. All right. And another video from Belinda Wilkes, our former director of Chandra. Less than one minute away now from the 95th Space Shuttle launch. 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. When Chandra went up on the shuttle, so the shuttle basically lit up the sky like daylight for a couple of minutes as it went up and the ground underneath our feet shook. Five, four, three. We have a go for engine start, zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. We were two or three miles away. So it's just an amazing feeling of, of the power that is needed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, which we needed to do to get in orbit. And also amazing to think that mankind can actually do this. It's very um, satisfying and exciting to see the results of all the years and all the people who've worked on Chandra and finally it goes up. So those are two short videos from some pretty awesome people that have worked for Chandra over the years. And Chandra is a really exciting piece of equipment. It goes about a third of the way to the moon. It's observing x-rays from the universe. So it needs to be up beyond our atmosphere because one of Earth's essentially superpowers is the fact that its atmosphere protects us from harmful X-ray radiation for the most part. So Chandra goes up about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest point in order to get a really great view of our high energy universe. And the types of things that Chandra gets to look at, it's pretty amazing all of the different types of objects Chandra can view, things like exploding stars, areas around black holes, things like colliding galaxies, and ever so much more. So what's really useful to know is that being able to look at all different kinds of light in our universe is very, very helpful to astronomers these days. It's like the more information you have access to, the easier it is or tends to be to be able to answer the questions that you have. So we're going to take a short poll, if someone could launch poll number two. I'd actually like to hear from you, what kinds of light are you familiar with? So which kinds of light have you either used or interacted with in your own life? Um, X-rays, perhaps ultraviolet light, uh, visible light, that sort of thing. Go ahead and put your answer in the poll. And I'll just sort of narrate as we're waiting for answers to come in that you've probably interacted with more lights, more kinds of light than you even realize. If you've ever, for example, heated up some macaroni and cheese in the microwave, you're using microwave light to be able to disturb the water molecules in your food and 
heated up very quickly. If you've ever gotten an x-ray at the dentist or the doctor for a broken bone or for perhaps a cavity, then the doctor has used x-ray light to be able to look down through the skin and tissue to the dense bone or tooth. Um, if you've ever used a remote control, you've used infrared light to be able to speak between two different devices. So many thanks for answering the poll. We're going to stop the poll. Um, it looks like we have most people were familiar with visible light, which of course is the type of light that we can see. It's also known as optical light. And yeah, as, as you can tell by looking at the screen, we have all different kinds of telescopes to be able to look at many different kinds of light. And you can kind of liken it to having a full piano keyboard, right? So for example, if you've ever played any music on a piano, if you go to middle C and a couple keys on either side, those few keys, that's like all of the information you would have if you could only look at the universe with human eyes through visible light or optical light. All the rest of those 88 keys on the keyboard would be missing to you. So if you wanted to play your favorite piece by, I don't know, Beethoven or Adele or whomever, then it wouldn't be very musical perhaps. But when you have access to all of the different keys on the keyboard, when you have access to all of those different kinds of light, then your piece of music can sound really, really beautiful. So it's very important to have um, all different kinds of light in order to be able to learn more about our universe. So let's go to our next slide. What I thought we would do now is just take a really quick tour, a mini tour of some of my favorite sites to see in the universe. Most of these images that you're going to be seeing will have different kinds of light in them. They'll always have Chander data, Chander information in X-ray light, but we'll also be looking at optical light from Hubble and radio light from radio telescopes, etc. So first I thought we would start out with some baby stars and stellar nurseries because they're just awfully adorable to look at, such as the Pillars of Creation or the Eagle Nebula that we're seeing here. Chander gets to look at clusters of young stars where stars are hanging out together, older, more mature stars that are some of the oldest stars in the Milky Way, stars that are mature and getting ready to explode, perhaps sometimes in our lifetime, perhaps not for another 500 years. Stars that give us a glimpse of what our sun might look like in, say, 4 billion years or so. They're called planetary nebulas. Exploded stars, which are my absolute favorite objects in the universe. We'll be seeing a few more different kinds of exploded stars today. Things like our very own Milky Way galaxy and the very center of our Milky Way galaxy, where our very own supermassive black hole resides. Galaxies in all shapes and sizes, like exclamation marks and cartwheels, whirlpools where they're interacting, jets that are creaming out of active galaxies, clusters of galaxies, which can have tens or hundreds and sometimes even thousands of galaxies all enveloped in hot clouds of gas. And sometimes even a cluster of galaxies that looks like it's smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So you can see the different types of breadth of objects that Chandra gets to look at and study for the scientists here on the ground. So just a few sort of vital statistics of Chandra since it's launched back in 1999. It's traveled for billions of kilometers, taken thousands of trips around the earth, trillions of bytes of data have been collected into a fantastic archive, and over 4 million lines of code have been written to operate Chandra, to collect the data, and to analyze the data. So coding is a really important part of making sure Chandra works. And I thought we would hear a short video from Sabina Hurley, who is our flight operations team manager, and hear what she has to say about this pretty incredible piece of spacecraft. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smoothed to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth, and they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together. Right, and they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square. 
and you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing, but then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind blowing. I love the way Sabina is able to describe all of those things, how technically challenging it was to build Chandra and to consider everything that you needed to consider in order to launch it. Because as you mentioned, because it's going a third of the way to the moon, it's at its farthest point, it's pretty far from us, right? No astronaut could ever access it again. So it had to work perfectly right out of the gate. They knew. So the way we get this information from Chandra is there is an object in the universe that Chandra is studying. The engineers and the scientists on the ground use code and send that code up to NASA um, through NASA's Deep Space Network up to the Chandra spacecraft. Chandra slews to the target, meaning it very slowly moves and then captures that information for some amount of time. Then that information that's recorded at um, on all the scientific instruments at the base of the telescope, it's packaged up into a suitcase of binary code of ones and zeros. And then it's sent on its merry way back through NASA's deep space network before it eventually it makes its way to our control center in Burlington, Massachusetts. And then eventually it might make its way to my desk or Nancy's desks or whomever's. So we're going to take a very brief tour at this point of what the Chandra Operations Control Center looks like. I think this is a really beautiful space and it's really exciting to be here. Um, maybe a little more exciting when it's not a pandemic. During the pandemic, there were a lot of safety protocols that were put into place to keep everybody safe and healthy. And I'm going to launch this tour. Once you come out of the elevators, you're dropped into this lovely little lobby area. And there are some beautiful images on the walls showing some of Chandra's greatest hits. There is also actually back here in this corner, a little copy of Chandra. I think it's about 10% of the actual size of the telescope. So you can see that. And on the wall over here is actually a banner um, that says the Chandra X-ray Center. And that banner was flown on the STS-93 mission. The astronauts used it as a backdrop behind their heads when they were making some of the communications um, to their ground link. And um, it's a little faded, but it has, I think, nostalgic memories for a lot of people on the mission. So let's go down this hallway. As soon as we get down here, there's a short little hallway that has a nice little visual timeline and mini exhibit of Chandra's history. Chandra was sort of created as an idea in the 60s. And then in the 70s and 80s, it was all about getting the funding and developing all of the equipment and the technology, and then completing the build in the 90s to be able to launch in 1999. So Chandra was a long time coming. And we're going to zip into my favorite room at this point, the main control room. And if I could just get a clue from either Nance or Kristen that everybody is seeing the control room okay at this point. Yep, I see it. Wonderful. So we're going to head into the control room. This is kind of like where the main downtown uh, activity kind of occurs for the care and maintenance of the Chandra telescope. As soon as we come in, you'll see that there are a series of these desks. This first console is the lead spacecraft engineers console. It's where they're making um, a lot of real time sort of monitoring of the spacecraft and activities. And then over here, right to the left is the 
command controller's console. So the person who's responsible to make sure that everything is cool, everything is going beautifully. There are a couple more rows of consoles down here. On this section, row two is the spacecraft engineers, essentially. Um, they're making sure that one particular part of the spacecraft is functioning okay. And in the next row, we have the row that's for the science instrument teams to make sure that the main instruments on board Chandra are working and good to go. And then a really lovely view right here in the front of main um, wall of screens where you're gonna see Chandra in its orbit, where you're gonna have all the sort of health and safety information, what the Chandra's telemetry is, what its temperature is, all of those important, you know, name, rank, serial number kind of information that we need to have on the telescope to make sure that it's operating okay. And you'll see in this screen, for example, shows you the uplink or the downlink to NASA's deep space network. It's a series of dishes around the world in Australia, in California, and in Madrid, where the dishes always have some telescope to be able to be talking to. And Chander gets to talk to one of these dishes about every eight hours to both receive its commands or to be able to send all of its sciencey goodness that it's captured back down to earth. And then a final stop on this tour would be over here in the corner. I thought this was kind of a cute thing. Um, some of the folks in the office have been drawing little um, murals on the walls over here. And you can see um, there's a cute little drawing with some of the engineers to keep it up, Chander Ops, meaning keep Chander up in space. Um, and that's kind of fun. So we can go back out here into the hallway and you'll see that the timeline for Chander continues. There's a number of other offices and meeting spaces down in this hallway, there is, for example, past where we came in, there's a big information technology um, network system, if you will. And then there's also the sleeping rooms for when staff have to be able to sleep if they have to stay over during storms or during emergencies, what have you. So that concludes the main part of the Chandra Control Center tour. As I mentioned, we are, we are still in a pandemic situation, so it's very greatly restricted who can come in to the control center at this point but hopefully things will be lifting up soon. All right, so we're gonna go back into the PowerPoint now. If I could just get a quick confirmation that you're seeing my screen again in PowerPoint. I think that we are. Wonderful. All right, so we're gonna to go to our next tour. So now that we learned about how essentially we take Chandra to the doctor, we have all of our scientists and engineers, administrators, technologists, and everybody who helps out on the telescope, they're able to um, figure out what are the issues, what needs to be studied, what Chandra's gonna look at at any given point of the day, so many different things to consider. And all of that information is uploaded through code. So code is a really critical an important part of what Chandra does. So now we're gonna look at the spacecraft and I'm gonna launch a second tour. Could I get a quick cue confirmation that you are seeing um, the virtual tour of the spacecraft? Yes. yes. Wonderful. All right, so we're gonna click here through a few stops. Hopefully the volume is okay. I'm gonna let another one of my colleagues take over to give my, my voice a rest. So let's hear from April. You bet. Welcome to NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Click anywhere on the screen to orbit the spacecraft and see it from all angles. Clicking will move you along to another stop on the tour. Chandra is almost 14 meters long, about the size of a school bus. It is only centimeters smaller than the largest payload the space shuttle could carry. X-rays are too energetic to bounce off traditional mirrors like we use to see our reflection. Instead, Chandra has nested, barrel-shaped mirrors that allow the X-rays to skip like a pebble across a pond and then focus on the detector 10 meters away.
Chandra uses cameras and spectrometers at its target to analyze the x-rays coming from deep space. Chandra's solar panels collect power for the telescope's detectors and its radio communication with the Earth. The electricity is also used to heat the mirrors to keep them from deforming in the cold temperatures of space. In order to provide motion to the observatory, Chandra has two different sets of thrusters. Chandra aims with high precision gyroscopes. The antennas on Chandra are its link to NASA's Deep Space Network, a series of three radio dishes located at different parts of Earth. Once on Earth, the system delivers the data to the Chandra X ray Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there we go. So I'm going to pop back in to PowerPoint at this point and talk a little bit more about that binary code. So as we mentioned, the suitcases of information that are sent down through NASA's Deep Space Network, it's just binary code. We use binary code to be able to talk to machines. You can talk to a smartphone, you can talk to your laptop. These days, I think you can even talk to toasters and refrigerators if they're smart. So binary code is a really useful way to be able to talk between devices because it's a system of ones and zeros, which are like an on and an off. And that's useful with any kind of electric device because with computers, for example, it's either on or it's off. So we use binary code to be able to capture all of that sciencey goodness again that I mentioned. And then here on Earth, we unpack it. So there is an automated process where that binary code is unpacked. And then once the scientist or the engineer has the information that Chander captured, it's first presented in a table, a table of information that records the time, um, the the photons, like those packets of energy that were captured, the location and the energy of them, for example. And then from there, we use more software um, and more coding to be able to translate that information into something, whether it's some sort of spectral plot or light curve, or probably what we're most familiar with, an image. So images of our universe, they are not space selfies where it's just, you know, click and shoot. You have to be able to process that data and coding and using different kinds of software and even certain kinds of algorithms can be used to be able to process that data in very specific ways. So we're going to do a little case study of one of my very favorite objects in the universe. I think I mentioned earlier that I really love exploded stars. I've just always found them to be really, really fascinating because they seem like they're this monstrous form of death, this huge massive explosion that can sometimes outshine all of the light of a galaxy. But exploded stars are also a sort of recycling of material, right? The so iron in our blood and the calcium in our bones come from previous generations of stars that exploded, whose material was eventually swept up into new generations of stars, of planets, of people. So we're going to look at Cassiopeia A. The image on the screen now is the very first image that we released from Chandra called its first light. It was about an hour's worth of observing time. And you can see this really beautiful remnant of the supernova remnant that we got with the only an hour worth of observing time. But when you have a mature system like Chandra that's been looking at that X-ray universe for a long time, we can go back to certain objects and look at them over and over again for scientific use and sometimes for engineering use to make sure your spacecraft is operating the way that it's supposed to be operating. And so we've done that with Cassiopeia A and we've looked at it now. We've got about over 2 million seconds worth of data. And you can really see the difference on the screen. Now we have a version with over about a million seconds worth of information that was captured from Chandra. And you can really see all all of that fantastic detail just coming alive. And in this case, the data, because we have such a rich pot of data from our archive, we've color coded it like you would color code a, 
a weather map on an app on your phone, for example, that might be color coded by temperature or by wind speed. In this case, we've color coded where the iron is, where the silicon is, where the oxygen is to be able to create this really lovely distribution map of where those tiny little bits of chemically goodness um, are located throughout the remnant. But with more kinds of coding and more kinds of scientific analysis, um, different kinds of software, we can also take information of something like an exploded star and bring it from a two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional model. And here on the screen now is the very first 3D model of observational data, things that were captured from the telescope of this exploded star Cassiopeia A. And this had lots of really fantastic scientific information as well. Um, it kind of helped us see that exploded stars like Cassiopeia A come off into pieces, a spherical shell, and then these really strong jets. Um, and then also we can take that 3D model and 3D print it. So it provides other people additional ways to access our universe when you can hold a really tiny, tiny version of it in your hands. This object in real life, by the way, the 3D print might only be about four inches across, but in reality, it's about 400 million billion times the surface area of our sun, because it's this massive cloud of gas and dust that's been expanding outward. And once we have that 3D model, we can use more coding and more software to bring it into virtual reality. And now this is one of my students. She's walking around inside that exploded star, our good friend Cassiopeia A, which is about 10,000 light years from Earth. And a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, in a year about 10 trillion kilometers. So 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. But she's able to walk around inside it and see where the pockets of iron and the silicon are and explore that in a a virtual way. But we can also take that information and with more coding and more software, translate it into sound. So I'm going to play a piece of what Cassiopeia A's data translated from the image into sound sounds like. So in that data sonification you just heard, a different sound was attached to those different elements. So iron was one sound, silicon was another sound, et cetera. And then we were radiating out from the center so we could kind of give the feeling of how this remnant is also expanding through space. So coding is incredibly useful to be able to process our data. And I thought we could just listen to Belinda Wilkes again, really quickly, our former director, to hear why it's important to check out that universe that we all live in. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this Earth and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. I really love the way that she expresses that. We are. So I thought we would take a quick break at this point to just mention some of the many different computer languages that have been included in Chandra, either on the spacecraft side or on the data processing side. Um, there's a real big hodgepodge of different kinds of languages that have been chosen and utilized for just different reasons, from Fortran and Perl to C and C++ to Python, which I think is very common these days, things like Java and PHP, even Visual Basic. We also use things like C-sharp and Unity scripting, G-code, GML for some of those different kinds of processing that I was showing earlier, as well as JavaScript and a host of other kinds of scripting languages as well. So I think it's safe to say that it is true that uh, computer science and coding is a, is a really important part of getting spacecraft like Chandra and others like the Hubble Space Telescope to be able to work and then to do all those really awesome things 
with the data. So we're going to take another poll at this point, if you want to launch it, Kristen, and go ahead and bring that up on our screen. But what I'm curious to know is, have you ever tried coding yourself? Go ahead and press yes, or perhaps not yet. I would, I'd love to hear from you. I learned how to code in college. I hadn't actually heard um, very much about coding before then. This was back in the late 90s, and we didn't have a really you know, rich computer science program at my high school. So I just learned HTML by doing a work study for an economics professor and he needed a web page. And that one web page pretty much launched my future because I loved it. I loved being able to see my results and then share it with the world really easily. And from HTML, I started learning things like other kinds of scripting languages and then took a Java class and a C++ class. Um, so yes, thank you. I see that you have coded. So I'm gonna stop sharing the poll, um, but thank you for filling that out. And at this point, I would like to hand it over to Kristen to be able to talk a little bit more about some of the resources that we have for you to try hands-on activities with NASA data. Um, from NASA's Universe of Learning. So Kristen, if you'd like to share your mute, I mean your, your audio, and I will go ahead and drive. And at any point you can drop a question in our chat. Great, so um, we have so many amazing and fun activities that can help you to explore coding and space science. <clears throat> Just a quick note to our educators, if you participate in an hour of code, you'll see that many of these activities fit really nicely into that. Um, so we're starting on our how to talk to spacecraft site. And here you can learn to write your name in binary code. You can create beaded pins and bracelets with secret binary messages. Um, we also have a new activity called binary beats where you can create music based on binary code. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so now we're taking a look at um, our recoloring the universe, which is um, computer based and there's a ton of really easy follow along videos. Um, here you'll learn basic coding skills using actual Chandra data um, on exploded stars and star forming regions and black holes. So there's everything from, um, you know, beginners to, um, to almost to experts. And this Um, Tinkercad is probably something a lot of you guys have used. Um, this activity series takes you through the basics of 3D modeling um, in astronomy. So you can start with uh, simple basic shapes and create an earth moon system, um, but then you, you can work your way up to using actual NASA data to create your own exploded star. Working with real data. Part one, Crab Pulsar. And if you have access to a 3D printer, um, which a lot of you might through school or maybe your library, um, in this, on this site, you can download files um, and print models of supernovas, pulsars, um, even a Chandra spacecraft model. Each section has images and some videos about the object, um, and then also those files that you would need to download. JS9 is an online data image analysis program, and it's used by professional astronomers, um, but we have a student-friendly um, version, um, and you can follow along with tutorials and activities that explore deep sky objects um, in depth.
And one of our newest um, activities, well, technically it's it's an app. It's a it's a free augmented reality app. Um, you can explore the universe and unlock the stories of women in space science, um, many who have been overlooked. Um, and in the app, you'll see some short stories that are about one to two minutes. And then there are longer journeys that you can, um, in which you can ask questions, you can listen to interviews, and you can also explore some 360 degree virtual reality content. Um, for instance, you can get a behind the scenes look at the Mars 2020 rover with uh, Christina Hernandez, who is an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science, but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions, and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. Yeah, Thank so, you, no, Chris, and that was great. Sure, I was just going to mention that I'll put the links to everything in the chat box. Perfect, thank you so much. And I just wanted to hear from one more gender scientist, Dr. Daniel Castro, because he had a great little summary of how much we've learned with Chander over the past two decades and counting. So here is Daniel. We didn't know that stars could emit x-rays, for example, and the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. And we get all of that amazing Chandra information in science, thanks to it. our coding. So I hope you have all enjoyed taking this little journey with us through Chandra's Operation Control Center, through a virtual tour of the Chandra spacecraft. Um, it's been uh, just a complete pleasure to be here today. And I hope you all realize that we've all taken a trip through time because all of these objects that we've been looking at, the light has been taking a very long time to get to us here on earth. So it's like you've been able to essentially time travel through the comfort of your own desk. So thank you again for joining us. And as Kristen mentioned, we'll be popping links into the chat box of all of the different locations that we visited today. And I hope you enjoyed this trip to outer space. So many, many thanks.